Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to Campbell Hall today. I'm Kumkum Bhavnani, and I chair the Women Culture Development Program housed in Global and International Studies, which nominated Dr. Vandana Shiva as a US UCSB lecturer for 2004. This nomination was supported by Environmental Studies, Law and Society, the Walter Capp Center, Women's Studies, the Office of International Students and Scholars, and Sociology, as well as by many individuals on the campus. Thanks also, of course, to Roman Baratiak, Susan Gwynn, George Yatchison, and Phil Grant for working so hard to make this lecture happen. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Dear Mama, it is Mother's Day in the USA, a day for which very low-paid flower producers, many of them mothers, employed by corporations such as Dole, have been working 15-hour days for the past few weeks to make sure there are enough flowers available. Today, Mama, I think of mothers, whether as foster mothers, adoptive mothers, social mothers, birth mothers, or indeed all of them combined. I think about women who do not personally wish to be mothers, yet who delight in children. I think about women who wish to be mothers, but cannot be, because they are refugees, economic or otherwise, or because healthcare is not free, so they cannot have the attention and treatment they seek. I also, Mama, think about women who mourn their children on this day. But Mama, I think about other mothers, such as the women of the Plaza de Mayo, who will not let go their memory of the disappeared in Argentina. I think of the anti-apartheid women in South Africa, who warned almost 50 years ago, now that you have touched the women, you have struck a rock, you have dislodged a boulder, and you will be crushed. I think about the women in the Intifada who struggle for the simple demand for a homeland and the women in Israel who support that demand. And I think of the Muslim women in India who fought, fight against the ghastly communal violence being waged by Hindus in the name of religion. Bread, peace, land, and freedom. These are the echoes in my mind today Land, Mother Earth as some call it, is our life and our future. Yet too often we refuse Mama to see the connection between us, the human, and the non-human universes. It is Vandana Shiva Mama who opened my eyes to this connection. Do you know of her? She is the 1993 recipient of the Right Livelihood Award, known as the Alternative Nobel Prize. She is the physicist who used to work in quantum physics, but whose wish to be more socially educated led to her determination to do broad-scale work on the environment. She is the woman who has demonstrated how violent the Green Revolution has been, who has insisted that the world know about CHIPCO, the movement of women to protect forests in the Himalayas who has shown us how wars are often fought over water, not just oil, who persists in, in pursuing diversity, human and bio, through her research institute, her BBC Reef lectures with Prince Charles, through the group Diverse Women for Diversity, and through her farm, Navdanya, where the neem, the tree of a thousand uses, abounds following a successful 10-year campaign to revoke its patent from private corporations. Sometimes people call our insistence on justice too idealistic, too sincere, too young, too political. But when I look at Vandana Shiva, I know that our desires are not misplaced. Our determination to have freedoms, as Vandana says, to ensure access to water, access to seed, access to food, access to medicine, to have freedom from want 
and freedom for creativity, that is nourished and strengthened by engaging with people like Vandana Shiva. The children today, Mama, Serena and Amal, gave me a plant which had a little uh, notice on it, sign on it saying, a seed is a promise. Mama, Vandana Shiva has a great sense of humor as well. I promise you will like her. With love. Thank you so much. And I want to greet all of you. Uh, happy Mother's Day. Because for me, being a mother is about a relationship of caring. And we are, we exist because somebody cared. Our biological mothers, of course, but others who sustained us, the earth. And if we have community, if we have love, if we have compassion, it is because we care. And I think it's time to all be mothers. I feel a bit worried that when I come to this country, motherhood kind of becomes this nervous notion. At the airport in San Francisco in my transit, there was this fat book, that fat, The Myth of Motherhood, about how oppressive that idea was. And I think that's been one of patriarchy's amazing victories, that patriarchy has managed to take the best strengths, the best freedoms, the best capacities, the best potentials that women bring to the world and womanly qualities bring to all humans and turn them into these untouchable kind of traits and qualities. And I think instead of an embarrassment about motherhood, I think it's time for all of us to say, we are all born of the earth, our mother, we will celebrate the motherhood in all of us, the caring in all of us. We are all mothers. And we have to all be mothers in order to be able to leave a future to Amal and Serena, to my Kartike, to Rustam, Mary and Thomas's son, and to all the children. In having transformed some ideas of the creative potential. We've managed to reduce to the world into a huge supermarket, highly impoverished supermarket. And in this supermarket, women have no place. I won't go into the details of it because I really want to talk about how we are trying to keep the world as our garden, our forest, our sacred homes, our victories. I want to talk to you about how the idea that our seeds are our mothers, our plants are our mothers, has come to us from ancient times and is the feeling with which a farmer will plant a seed in the soil even today. He or she will say a prayer about creating exhaustless potential, because that is what the seed means. The seed is the embodiment of limitless potential. Limitless both in terms of how rejuvenative seed can carry on forever. The seeds we have received from our ancestors we don't know when. To me, it's always a miracle that long before Columbus sailed in the wrong direction. <laughs> We've had crops from the Americas. People were exchanging seeds. The amaranth came to India. We don't know when. And was called the amaranth, which means amar, which means the everlasting. The Rig Vedic hill treated healing plants as the mothers. Mothers, you who have a hundred forms and a thousand revelations. You who have a hundred ways of working, make this person whole for me. 
Be joyful, you plants that bear flowers and you that bear fruit. Like mares that win the race together, the growing plants will carry us to the other side. Fly away disease along with the blue jay and the jay. Disappear with the howling of the wind and with the rainstorm. Let one help the other. Let one stand by the other. All of you working together, let this speech of mine succeed. I think that is the recovery of every relationship of sustenance, of nurturing, of continuity of life being a relationship based on mothering that we need to celebrate today. So once again, happy Mother's Day. When we see in our plants that nourish us, that give us food, our mothers, see them as having a hundred forms, a thousand revelations, hundreds way of ways of working, you deal with those plants with reverence, you receive them as gifts, you have a duty to protect them, to conserve them. In, um, in every culture that has been a sustainable culture, seed saving has been a duty. A duty so high that even if you have no food, you cannot eat the seed. In my region, um, during the Gorkha Wars, people were found dead in their huts. But the seed, tomri, it's called, it's in the squashes the seeds were kept, every tomri in every hut was full of seed. And the reason you don't eat seed corn and seed grain is because that's the continuity of life. When we sow our seeds, we pray. May this seed be exhaustless. May the potential keep unfolding. This duty to save seed, to keep it for the future, to increase the diversity, to allow the seeds to evolve according to the right place for them, is why humanity actually, as long as women were the seed keepers, has increased the diversity. Yeah. Nature might have given one species that was the rice, indica, rices. And yet out of that, by selecting one after the other, women created rices. Rices that are so tall, 18 feet tall, that they can rise and fall with the floods in the Gangetic Basin. They literally get harvested from boats. Rices that can deal with the snow and frost up in the high Himalaya. Rices that can deal with the saline water in the coast, salinity, resist, saline resistant rices. Rices that are wonderful for lactating mothers and are fed specially for them. 200,000 rice varieties is what the women of India as seed keepers and seed breeders had evolved. And at no point did any one of those women turn around and tell her sisters, now I have evolved this new rice, I've bred a new rice, I've found new traits. Now onwards, it is my property. Now onwards, you will pay me royalties. When I started seed saving in India, one of the things that really touched me was, if you, you know, so many of our rituals become in empty rituals of repeating acts. But so many of our rituals are related to germination, where you sow out seeds and you celebrate and worship the, the germinated crop. Turns out these were all germination tests. And they were wonderful tests that I grew out my seeds, and Navdanya, the name of the seed conservation movement that I started, was named because I used to teach in Bangalore and, uh, and two things happened around the same time. During a seed collection trip, I found a farmer growing nine seeds, and he educated me into recognizing 
that the nine seats were a reflection of the nine planets, and the balance in your fields and how you do agriculture is part of your cosmic duty to maintain ecological balance at every step in the smallest detail. But even more importantly, there was a festival of New Year called Ugadi, and the women grow out nine seeds. The grandmothers are one, the ones who still remember, because the younger, for the younger ones, it's just, you grow it out, you have a lot of fun, you eat a lot of sweets, you dress in nice saris. The grandmothers will tell you, we did it, and when one of the crops didn't germinate well, you ask your neighbor, you ask your mother, because that crop needed a better seed. These were germination tests built into culture. And there is no part of the world where agriculture, not industrialized and not controlled by capital, did not have women as seed keepers. Women have been the seed experts, the seed breeders, the seed selectors, the biodiversity conservers of the world. And if today we have seeds we can save, if they, today we have communities who can tell us the unique properties of different crops and different seeds, it's because we've had generations of women not recognized as agronomists, not recognized as breeders, not recognized in any way as having knowledge, but the 10,000 years of human expertise in feeding us is a women's expertise. And again, let's say thank you to all our ancestors. The reason we need to recognize our debt to them so deeply is because the work that was done over millennia by hundreds and thousands of unknown grandmothers around the world, that work, as happened so often, is now being claimed as the invention of a handful of corporations. A patent in today's world is an exclusive right to own, produce, sell, buy, distribute the patented product or any product made from a patented process. The original name, the original use of the word patent actually came with dear old Columbus. What he got was a letters patent, and these were different from the sealed and closed letters. The sealed and closed letters were what kings and queens sent for conspiracy, murder so-and-so, get rid of that one, let's have a war against so-and-so. But these were open letters because these were not meant for conspiracy amongst the European kings and queens. These were about taking over other people's lands, and the letters patent had a wonderful statement saying, Go out and seek lands not ruled by white European princes and own them on our behalf. You'll get a share of the gold, you'll get a share of the land, we'll get the rest. That's how colonialism started, with these little pathetic pieces of open parchment called letters patent. And patent then meant only open, not sealed. Today patent means something very different. It is a new creation of property. A creation of property out of what has belonged to the common heritage, a shared heritage of nature and communities. Not till 1995 could humanity become so perverse that it could start to claim that we have invented the plants that feed us. Not till 1995 was it possible for an international trade treaty, the WTO, to put into it new property rights laws embodied in the trade-related intellectual property rights agreement that not only allows corporations to own seeds and life forms as property, but forces countries to introduce this new form of poverty, property. 
And it's because to me, from the day I heard about this, way back in the 80s, when the Uruguay round of GATT was being negotiated, and the treaty was not finalized, but it was being brought in, I decided to do my personal satyagraha immediately. I said, this is not acceptable. The idea that life can be treated as an invention and farmers can be criminalized for performing their duty, saving seeds, is unacceptable to me. And so I went back home, 1987, from this meeting in Geneva and started to save seeds. Out of that have grown all the other movements that today are ways for us to defend our freedom. Well, the Basmati was mentioned, uh, the Neem was mentioned. Uh, the Basmati was the next one. This patent was taken by a Texas-based company. Now you will recognize that Texas is not really the home of evolution of rice. But there some, seems to be some kind of a cultural problem there that assumes that it doesn't matter where natural resources exist. It's need to belong to Texas, <laughs> or people from Texas. So it could be oil in the Middle East, Basmati of Dehradun, so what? And the Basmati of Dehradun, you know, you, you'll probably be eating Basmati of Punjab, of Haryana, of Pakistan, but it'll always get sold as basmati from Dehradun, Dehraduni basmati, because Dehradun is the place most famous for the nice aroma. Now, our basmati used to grow in about 10 by 20 miles. Most of it is under concrete now. And we have a few areas where we still do farming of basmati. Um, but near the foothills of the Himalaya is the home of origin. This is where the aroma was identified, evolved, and the seed was bred. But in 1997, a company called Rice Tech claimed in a patent number 5663484 that it had invented the height of the plant, the length of the grain, the aroma in the rice, and the one that really got me even methods of cooking. You know. In India, you know, chapatis you learn second. Rice you get first. You know. it, all it takes is the right amount of water with the right amount of rice. Mothers teach you that very early in life. Methods of cooking rice, invent in 1997. None of us were cooking rice before that. <laughs> now, if you think that is bad, look at this one. This is a patent number 6098905. And this is held by a grain trading giant called Conagra. It's, it's also a processing giant. They're not even seed breeders. Yeah? So their patent is for Atta flour. If Texas has this problem of owning everything in the world and finding it a problem that people don't recognize the property rights. I think something's gone funny in contemporary United States. You take words from other cultures and just add the English name to it. So you say chai tea, but chai is tea. <laughs> yeah. so you go to Starbucks, it says chai tea. <laughs> well, atta is flour. Yeah. Atta is flour. Well, Conagra has a patent on atta flour. It's like a patent on flour, flour. <laughs> now the patent on flour, flour says, the present invention relates to a method for producing an atta flour, which is typically used to produce Asian breads, such as chapati and roti. They haven't yet said that's a separate invention, but I'll come to that one later. The art of flour method includes passing an amount of wheat through a device designed to crack the wheat so as to produce an amount of cracked wheat followed by passing the cracked wheat into flour. <laughs> we weren't eating chapatis and roti till four years ago when they got that patent. 
the company that you're all familiar with in the area of genetic engineering is a company that didn't even occur in the list of agricultural companies in the 80s. They weren't in the seed business. Most seed industry of the 80s used to be small family firms that had then decided to dedicate themselves to improving seed diversity, seed multiplication. In this country, because of hybrid maize, you had a few families like Wallace that became big companies. In the 80s, these small seed firms started to get bought up by the big chemical giants. So the co companies that used to be chemical companies, some of them also pharmaceutical companies, also sellers of agrochemicals, bought up not just the seed industry, but they bought up all the biotechnology industry that had largely come out of university-based science. These were venture capital firms that had been spun off from university research. So within about a period of five years, two things happened. The chemical industry, pharmaceutical industry, seed industry, biotech industry became one industry. If you look today at seed production, and if you try and see who is selling the genetically engineered seed worldwide, you will find 93% of all genetically engineered seeds sold anywhere in the world is sold by one company that knew nothing about seed in its history of evolution. It knew how to make toxic chemicals, it knew how to produce Agent Orange, it knew how to make Roundup, but I can tell you, I'm sure even today, they don't really know what a plant is. This company is Monsanto. And Monsanto is related very much to genetic engineering. And I'll talk also about genetic engineering um, because in a way it relates to another level of appropriating women's expertise, displacing the soundness and safety of women's expertise-based health systems, food systems. Monsanto is trying very hard to sell a genetically engineered wheat, which nobody wants. And um, every few months they are in um, Canada trying to push the Canadian Wheat Board to accept this. So the whole world thinks that all that uh, Monsanto wants is control over a genetically engineered wheat. No, what Monsanto wants is control over wheat. If genetic engineering is the way to open up the space for new property rights, and that's the way the industry will go. But while through genetic engineering, early patents were taken, most patents today are based on straightforward biopiracy, the theft of women's innovation of centuries. And in the case of wheat, the latest piracy we are fighting is uh, in Europe, the patent is 0445929, but I've just found out there are three patents of similar kind in the United States Patent Office. Because there's something very interesting about the patent issue. The framework of laws that you must obey is decided by the World Trade Organization, but the patent offices are still sitting in national systems. So the US will give a patent, Europe will give a patent, India will give a patent. In the case of Monsanto's wheat patent on a traditional ancient Indian wheat variety, it's a patent on the wheat, on all wheat derived from it, on all flowers derived from the wheat, on all dough made from that wheat, on all edible products made from that dough. Why is this wheat of interest? The wheat is of interest because it's a low elasticity wheat, which means it makes crisp products. And so far the industry has had to add chemicals for crispness. Now they have a wheat that'll give them crisp biscuits. You know, and with all our health consciousness of A, not wanting chemicals, but also I notice, you know those thin, 
You know, no, no one wants those nice, thick cookies. Those thin little biscuits. Well, this Indian wheat was perfect without chemicals. Now, the fascinating thing about this particular patent is, it's a patent referring to an Indian variety, and the name of the Indian variety is Napal. So when I came to know of this patent, I said, Napal? In Hindi, that means Nap Napal means the one that gives no seed. There is no way an Indian farmer would have named a variety that which gives no seed, because seed is meant to give seeds. And farmers breed seeds to give seeds. Monsanto and the USDA and Delta and Pineland breed terminator seeds, so that seed won't give seed. How many of you know of the terminator seed? Now, seed is not meant to be terminated. It's the very nature of seed to continue. Napal means literally the terminator. They didn't really cook it up. We've had to do a lot of work. And, you know, I sometimes say all this has ended up turning us into really smart detective agents. We're all sort of daily 007s trying to protect our mother's and grandmother's legacies. So, you know, in the months since we found out about this, the first thing I found out was that it had been collected in 1948 by a USDA scientist. So, we do more homework, we go to more gene banks, we collect these little sheets which is supposed to be passport data, like we have passports, plants also have passports when they start to get collected. And the passport data is fascinating because it says it was collected at latitude 30 degrees, 80 degrees, which lies kind of near Bijnor, or south of Shah Jahanpur, in the plains of India. The altitude is 3,000 meters, where you don't even grow wheat. It's above the wheat growing area. So I look at the name of the village and say, maybe something, something went wrong and the name of the village, Marsha. So I send messages all over and say, find me the village called Marsha. I get a message back from the Anthropological Society, from government offices, from our field colleagues who work in this region. Say, Marsha, it's not a name of a village, it's a name of a tribe. And you can just see how the memory of the earth is being erased in this process of biopiracy. The names, the places to which we could express our gratitude, to which we could go back to replenish our eroded biodiversity. In that rush of piracy, everything's being cooked up. That's why we need to turn back to our mothers. We need to turn back to our mothers to find out what are the different wheat varieties. On our farm, we grow 30 wheat varieties, and we found some of them have similar traits, but they don't have this double null trait that is patented. But there were hundreds and thousands of wheat varieties that were documented by a couple called Sir Albert Howard and his wife, GLC Howard. Of course, Howard is remembered still. He's the founder, as he's called, the founder of modern organic farming. But his wife was as much a wheat expert. She's rarely remembered. But there's a wonderful book she wrote on the wheats of India. And we are going through every one of those wheats to, rem to name our wheats correctly and not have them wrongly named as Terminator. But this habit of fudging, you know, many of you are students. And one of the things you're taught in school, you're taught in college, you're taught in universities, is you don't cheat, right? Do your teachers tell you cheat? Tell a lie? Fudge your data? You're going to fail. Unfortunately, the dominant system that is trying to appropriate the control over seed, the control over food, the control over biodiversity from the hands of women. Because whether it's as seed keepers or is as food producers and food processors, turns out it's largely women who've done that work because of the kind of division of labor most societies have had. Today that work 
is being appropriated as a for-profit activity. And the patents are part of that appropriation and control. But the tools of technology are also intimately linked to it. And genetic engineering is the preferred tool for the new control. The common story about genetic engineering is it's necessary because we need to produce more food and there are 800 million, billion, 800 million 1 billion people hungry. Um, we won't have more food unless we use genetic engineering. Well, the first thing is those 800 million people who are permanently hungry today are people who are growing food. Hunger earlier used to be a problem of rural, urban areas. In rural areas, you might have hunger when there was a bad drought. It was localized in space and time. You might have had a war, some reason to block food production. But today you can have all the food in your field and you can die of hunger. 1942 Bengal famine, when two million people died. It wasn't that there wasn't enough rice. Amartya Sen has written a whole book on his entitlement theory, his Nobel Prize is related to his entitlement theory. And he has shown that there wasn't lack of food. What collapsed were the entitlements. And why did the entitlements collapse? Because there was war. The British wanted to take every grain of rice out of Bengal. It was appropriated from the peasants. And it did not stop till the women organized and said, Jan Debo Dhan Debo Na. We will give our lives, but we will not give our rice. The other day I was doing a Save the Ganga journey and I was down in, the, in Bengal near the area where the Ganges meets uh, uh, the Indian Ocean. And there were these beautiful paintings, mural paintings in this village hall that had been very active in the independence movement. Um, because if you remember 1942 of the year of the famine was also the year of the Quit India movement, where eventually the country just rose and said, we will govern ourselves so our people are not dying of starvation. But it was the women who led the movement. And on this mural were these beautiful paintings of Bengali women with their nice white saris, red borders, standing with sticks in front of the rice that had just been harvested, refusing to part with it. The hunger of the world is related to Injustice in trade. It is not a problem of production. It never has been. But there's other reasons why this idea that genetic engineering is necessary to solve the hunger problem, because technically that's not true. There are only two varieties floating around the world. After 20 years, that's all the companies could give. The women could give us 200,000 rice varieties. We don't know how many bean varieties. We don't know how many corn varieties. Thousands of every crop. Two applications in five crops. And the two applications are herbicide-resistant crops, or Roundup Ready, as it's called, Roundup Ready Soya, Roundup Ready Corn. Now, what does Roundup Ready mean? It's not that the corn is saying, I'm ready, spray me. No, it's not saying that. <laughs> it's basically a crop designed to be resistant to the spraying of the herbicide. So it survives the spray. Earlier, if you sprayed Roundup, the crops would die, and therefore it was always, a, as it's called, a pre-emergence herbicide. It was sprayed before the planting. But with huge use of Roundup, there was lots of residues. It started to affect the yields. And that's why they evolved this variety. But now they want to spread it worldwide. And they want to spread it to regions like India, where in every little farm we have 250 crops. We have trees, we have fruit trees. We have mixtures, and even the volunteer plants, which were never planted, are the richest source of nutrition. If you've been in South India, you'll see women walking down the streets in Bangalore 
with little baskets saying, Sapu, Sapu Lelo, Sapu, Sapu. Sapu is about 20 weeds that they have collected, the most nutritious sources of vitamin A and iron. Now, Roundup is a ready-made recipe for two things. One is wiping out the biodiversity, and secondly, wiping out the livelihoods and sources of nutrition for the women. We've just been extremely successful in India to get a policy decision through that herbicide-resistant crops are totally inappropriate to India because they will destroy women's livelihoods. Of course, that doesn't stop Monsanto from distributing um, Roundup. Year before, we had a very, very bad drought in the desert strait of Rajasthan. And uh, in the newspaper, I saw a little, little item that said, Monsanto gets an award for a miracle corn variety in um, Rajasthan. So I say, but they don't have a clearance for doing genetically engineered corn. What are they up to? We go down into Rajasthan and find that A, the award was given by Monsanto to itself. <laughs> Secondly, that whereas Monsanto in its literature was announcing 90 quintals, which is 9,000 kilograms of yield per acre, in the award, they had cited 20. Their field staff told us 12, and the farmers who'd actually grown those varieties gave us seven. By a f they're off by a factor of 10. Show me one lab exam you would pass by if you were off by a factor of 10. But the real reason they were there was not for the corn. They were distributing Roundup as an anti-drought medicine. Now, you know, just think of it. Here's a package of Roundup with English on it. Here are communities that speak some other language. They're desperate because there's a drought. And they're told, here's a miracle chemical that's going to deal with your drought. And then they give themselves an award for lying. I remember an ad in Bangalore, a Monsanto ad which had a woman's hands, and it said, next to it said, liberate yourself, spray Roundup. And the women's hands were tied with greens. Those plants that we talk of as our mothers, as our partners, as our sahayaks, our helpers, are being redefined in this patriarchal vision of capitalism as the new bondage. Our sources of freedom are being defined as slavery. Our slavery has got a new name called free trade. And of course, science in the process is giving way to pseudoscience. Last year, when the Bt cotton, which is the second category of crops with toxin in it, these are crops which have a gene taken from a bacterium turned into a high dose, and in the bacteria, it is a prototoxin. It's a toxin only in the gut of particular insects with an enzyme, particular enzyme. This is not a ready-made toxin. But in the plant, it becomes a ready-made toxin. And it's a high-dose toxin. It has promoters, viral promoters, to pump the expression up. Every genetically modified crop, whether it's herbicide-resistant or a Bt crop, has in addition to either the gene to allow more toxic spray, or the gene to produce more toxics in plant, in addition to it, every genetically modified crop today has a gene for antibiotic resistance because it's used as a marker. Because the technology is so crude and clumsy, they have to put this marker to see whether the crop will survive at the, at the cell level, whether, whether it absorbed the particular trait. And the third, inevitable element of any genetically modified food and crop which is never talked about is the most dangerous. These are viral promoters. These are what are called the promoters, but they're always very, very virulent viruses. 
No studies have been done about what do they do when we eat these foods. Any scientist who's ever done a study has been silenced or been removed. Ignacio Sapella did the studies on the contamination of corn in Mexico. Good study. All he did was observe, observe, how, observe how much of the corn in the home of diversity in Mexico, from which, which is the place from where corn has moved to the rest of the world, how much of it was contaminated with Bt from America, because Mexico has not yet allowed its planting. He has been removed from tenure. University of Berkeley. Arpad Putsai was asked by the UK government to look at the potatoes, genetically modified potatoes and their safety. When Arpad Putsai did his work for government, as he was asked, and he found in the rat feeding experiments that the brain shank, shrank, the pancreas expanded, and the immunity collapsed. And he said, if this is happening to rats in three months of feeding, what's going to happen to human beings through a lifetime of eating? We need to look more. He was removed. We have Galileo after Galileo. The reason they can't touch me is I gave up my job in 1982. There's nothing for them to take me out of. <laughs> but there are two stories you're going to be repeatedly told. I'm sure you're already told these stories, but they'll get more aggressive. You'll be told, BT Cotton is doing wonderfully in India. We monitored it last year, and this year again, the data shows Last year, it was one-fifth the promised yields. And the promise of 10,000 rupees additional income was actually a 6,000 rupee loss. Well, this year's data, in Monsanto's claim is four times more than the reality in pesticide reduction, 12 times more on yield data, 100 times more on profit data than the reality. You are being fed lies about how these crops are performing. But you're also being fed lies about the miracles. I remember when they first started to talk about golden rice. You know, the literature was sent to me. I did a quick analysis. Golden rice is rice with a vitamin A in it. About 10 years later, they'll have this crop. At the end of it, they'll have 30 micrograms of vitamin A. If you had to get your daily requirement, you'd need to eat three kilos. On the other hand, our mothers and our grandmothers and their great-grandmothers gave us the most amazing cuisine where you can sprinkle five leaves of curry patta, ten leaves of coriander, and you get 1,400 micrograms of vitamin A per 100 grams of food. 70 times more richer sources Absolutely no problem in terms of new water use because you grow your coriander here and your, your curry patta can grow in a little plot in a slum if you go to, go to Chennai, go to Bangalore. The tiniest of homes in a slum will have their own curry patta plant. It's such a generous plant. It gives so easily. It needs no space. The pumpkin, they try to argue with me, oh, you're trying to have a luxury recipe only the Westerners eat vegetables. The third worlders do not have the luxury of eating vegetables. I said, come talk to our mothers. <laughs> the richness of plant life that is the basis of third world cuisine is just so amazing. And what is at stake in these lies about genetic engineering that without golden rice, our kids will keep going blind is in my view an insult to our mothers. We need to start looking more intimately with a little more respect. And that's why we have, in, in India, part of what we do is, besides saving the seeds, besides doing the organic farming, we have what we call grandmother's universities. We get little kids to sit with their grandmothers and just ask, what do they use? You know, they go to the forest if there's a forest. They go to the field if there's a field. And they recognize every plant. Because grandmothers know every plant in every 
little ecological niche of the local ecosystem. They are our real experts. And it is that expertise which we need for our richness, our cultural richness, our nutritional welfare, and for the intellectual evolution of our societies. Not the petri dish view of life, where all you know is how to bombard a cell with a gene gun, then bombard it with a cancer, then bombard it with a virus. You don't even know what the whole plant will look like by the end of that petri dish vision. It's that shrinking of the human imagination in the hands of those who merely seek to see how can we make more money by preventing life from evolving on its own terms in its diversity, its plurality, its abundance, its generosity. And we basically make generosity a crime, seed saving, seed saving is an intellectual property crime. How do we make abundance a crime? Create impoverished vitamin A rice so people don't look to other sources. And this criminalization has reached unprecedented peaks. I'll just give you two very quick examples. There's a Canadian farmer called Percy Smeitzer. And any time now we're going to have a decision in the Supreme Court to reverse a lower court de decision which ruled in a case brought by Monsanto, Monsanto herbicide-resistant canola contaminated Percy's canola. Percy had been growing the same seed for 50 years. Monsanto sent out detectives, found that they were herbicide-resistant genes, sued him and said, your crop belongs to us, you are a thief. He said, no, you're the polluter. I didn't buy your seed, I didn't take the seed, I didn't plant your seed. If your genes exist in my crop, they've come through pollution. And the courts ruled under Monsanto's pressure that now that there was new patent laws, the genes occurring anywhere without Monsanto's permission was equivalent to theft. Fortunately, in the US, in an appeals board, there's just been a ruling, I think, last week, which says if this logic is adopted, if through contamination, the companies that own the patents can start claiming the crops in two or three years, these companies will own all our crops. And then the prayer, give us this day our daily bread, will no more be to your version of creation or your mother. With a second criminalization that is even more serious, and I invite you all to get involved in this, the United States in May last year introduced a case against Europe in the WTO, saying Europeans not eating genetically modified food was a trade crime. Force feeding is a fundamental right. This case, the submission has just been made we have for a year been dealing with building up a movement, a movement to both consolidate the experience because we know what's happening in India, you know what's happening in this part of California, the Mexicans know what happened to the corn, the Argentinians know how they are dying of negative incomes growing soya, the Brazilians know how they are being criminalized for growing a crop that they'd never bought as a patented crop, and now Monsanto's saying, pay us royalties. And we believe it's time for us all to recognize that we have one common global problem, and it's one company. And we'd better learn to deal with it together. <laughs> we are actually going to also do a legal challenge serious legal challenge in the WTO, and our grounds are very simple. Our grounds are the US government being used by a Monsanto does not represent US citizens. And that is why we'll do this as a global citizens GMO challenge. And for those of you who'd like to be part of it, I'd invite you all to sign on at gmochallenge at yahoo.com and invite your friends to do it too. 
The second thing we want to do through this case is to basically say, and rules that prevent us from making our food choices and force us to give up our food freedoms are not acceptable to us. WTO must change. We will not give up our freedoms. Thank you. Thank you. This program was produced by the LA Sound Posse. The LA Sound Posse records speeches and events dealing with social justice issues. We anti-copyright these recordings and share them via the internet, via community radio, and as CDs distributed through grassroots social justice groups, nonprofit organizations, committed individuals, and others. Our goal is to be part of the creation of a broad-based, participatory, and democratic civic media in support of the creation of a truly democratic society. You can reach us on the web at www.lasoundposse.org. Contact us for copies of this program on CD, or you can download it for free at www.radioforall.net. That's radio, the digit four, all, dot net. If you valued what you heard in this program, please feel free to copy and distribute it to others who you think would benefit from hearing it, thus becoming yourself part of a decentralized, democratic, civic media. Thanks very much for listening.